Hey there, Writer Rebels. Welcome to Back to School Author Academy. Today we're going to be talking about personification. Hello everyone, it's me, Scarlett Cole, young adult author, YouTuber, and storyteller. And today I am here with my Back to School Author Academy to talk about various different literary devices to punch up your prose. I'm doing this in September as we are in back to school season, as well as gearing up for National Novel Writing Month in November. So this is a really good opportunity to brush up on some of those author skills that a lot of us have. And hopefully some of the topics that I will be covering will be new to you and something that you can utilize a little bit later. Today we are going to be talking about personification, but before I get into that, make sure if you are enjoying this and you are enjoying the series to give it a like below this video, hit that thumbs up, and if you don't want to miss any videos from me in this series, make sure you're hitting that subscription bar and the notification bell below this video. As I said, our word of the day is personification, and personification is a term we use when we add human characteristics to a non-human subject. For instance, one of the ones you will probably see very often is somebody referring to the wind biting their nose. We all know that wind does not have a mouth, it does not have teeth, it cannot physically bite someone's nose. However, a human could bite something because they do have teeth and a mouth and, you know, free will to actually go over and bite someone. So we are taking that human action of biting and adding it to a non-human subject the wind. So this is a very simple example of personification. It can be extended a lot longer in some particular passages or it can be something very simple as a one-line thing. So today I'll provide some examples of personification as well as explain some of the reasons why you might want to use it in your prose as well as some pitfalls or things to watch out for if you are choosing to use personification. You might already be using this without even realizing what you're doing and a lot of the literary devices that I will be discussing through this author academy are things that people have just picked up over time, reading stories, hearing stories, and telling stories. But they may not realize that this is something that has an actual name and can be used strategically to make their writing shine so much more. And we're all in luck today because I'm going to be using my own published novels to give you examples of personification. I won't always use my own stuff throughout this series, but I do use all the literary devices that I will be discussing. However, sometimes people do it a little bit better than I do. So for today, I had some examples of personification that I knew I could find very easily. So I figured I would provide them and they both kind of have a bit of a different feel. So hopefully this will help illustrate my point. So the first one comes from Mercury Rises. This is my Robin Hood retelling from the point of view of Maid Marian. In this particular scene, we have two of the main characters that are basically standing on a street corner, kind of, they've just come down from a very intense scene. They're going to be walking into another intense scene. And this is just kind of a moment of calm before they move into that and allowing them to process the things that have happened. It's actually a rather emotional scene for them. So I wanted it to have that bit of resonance. So for me, I started the chapter with, the night held its breath, leaving us in calm, eerie stillness while it waited for something to happen. The stars too afraid to come out from behind the clouds. So in this instance, I'm actually using two bits of personification. I'm talking about the night itself holding its breath. Obviously the night doesn't breathe, so assuming that it's holding its breath, is putting that human characteristic onto something non-human. I also say that the stars are too afraid to come out. So obviously the stars do not have emotions as far as I'm aware. I am not an astronaut or anybody who studies space, but I'm assuming that stars do not have emotions. Therefore, they would not feel fear. That is something that is a human emotion that I am applying to a non-human subject. So I use personification twice in this one sentence. The whole point of doing that is to give a calm and still eeriness feeling. I could have written this very simply as it was a calm night and there were no stars, but putting it the way that I did makes it a little bit more dramatic and a little bit more interesting for the reader to read than a simple sentence. It may be the route that you wanna go if that's your book, but in this particular instance, it's giving a feel to the scene. And because it's at the beginning of of a chapter, it's really setting everything up for the next several paragraphs that are kind of eerie and calm as they process this information. 
The next example that I'm going to provide is from my book Sleepless. This one is a little bit of a witchy YA. It's got a very fall vibe to it. So in this particular instance, we have our main characters running through the woods and she's been kind of creeped out a little bit. So as she's running through the woods, it is twilight. It's starting to get darker and she's kind of processing things in her mind and a little bit of creeped out. And so as she looks out into the woods, she's starting to see shadows and she just kind of wants to get out of there as soon as possible. So this is actually in a larger paragraph, but I'm only going to read the parts that apply to personification. So the air swirled around us. The dying fall forest writhed and beckoned on the crisp breeze as it whispered a hushed warning. Go now, it seemed to say, get out. So in this one, I'm actually being a little bit more obvious that I'm using personification in that I'm actually using the words that she is imagining these trees to be saying. So the trees aren't saying anything because the trees can't talk. Also, they are not whispering, they are not writhing, they are not beckoning. These are things that are human characteristics that I have applied to the forest to give it that foreboding feel and make her feel even that more creeped out, which was basically what I was trying to go for. I could have very simply said the wind blew through the trees and it was really creepy. Obviously that could be done a whole lot better than that, but I didn't necessarily have to use personification, but by using personification, it elevates that passage and makes it all that more creepy. So why would anybody want to use personification? There's a lot of really good reasons why authors would put this in their work. However, a few of the very common ones are number one, to engage more senses. So in the example that I used right at the beginning about the wind biting someone's nose, obviously most people are going to understand what a bite feels like. They are immediately going to understand that the wind is eliciting a, a painful, sharp experience to the person that is in that particular scene. Even if someone hasn't actually bitten their nose before. They are going to understand that and it's going to engage one more sense, thus bringing the reader even deeper into the story. Another reason would be to create mood. If you are trying to have something that's a little bit more flowy, then you can use personification to do that. The words choices that you make are going to create the mood that you have for your particular story. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something creepy or foreboding like the examples that I provided. For example, you could be talking about a great day and the person gets out of bed and they see the sun jumping off the horizon. Well, the sun can't jump, so obviously this is a personification of a human characteristic with a non-human subject, but that's going to be a little bit more upbeat and positive than the examples that I provided. So you can definitely use it to create a positive or negative mood or anything in between of what you're trying to get to. The next reason might be for tension and pacing. So. By using personification, you can either tighten or loosen your pacing depending on what you want to do. If you are using something about the wind biting someone's nose again, biting gets to the point immediately. You can move to the next sentence and that pacing can be tightened. You can use shorter sentences because people don't need as much description as they totally understand that human element that you've put on a non-human subject so you don't have to spend time explaining it. You can just move on to the next concept. You can also use it to drag things out. From the example in Sleepless, I'm actually trying to slow the pacing in that particular scene. The two characters are actually running and have been running for a given amount of time. So the pacing has been rather quick up to this point. When I get them into a dark woods, I wanted it to feel creepy and foreboding and long. I wanted that to drag out. So I was using personification to drag that scene out and make it feel that much longer so that it has the right effect of what I was going for. And the last reason that is most common that people use personification is to create imagery and poetry. So depending on what genre you're writing, there's a lot of people who will write with a very whimsical voice or a very literary voice or want to get a certain sort of image or vibe across in their writing. In some genres, it's not. It's quick pacing, it's not very descriptive, and you're probably not going to use personification as often unless you are trying to use it as one of those ways to tighten your pacing that I explained before. But if you do tend to have more of that literary kind of voice, you may use personification or similar types of literary devices a lot more often as it's going to 
give it a very different poetic kind of feel to your writing. So if that's something that you're going for, personification could be a really good tool to have in your author toolbox. So what are some precautions about using personification? Well, there's really two things that I would like to warn you about in terms of personification. And one is that you do not want to use personification for everything. If everything in the world all of a sudden has these human qualities, you're going to have your readers feel like they're in Wonderland as opposed to in the real world. If they are, then that's obviously going to be a little bit different in some fantasy worlds. Maybe the trees can talk, but in most cases, it's going to be something that if you go too far and every single thing has a human characteristic to it, it's going to feel probably a little bit campy and a little bit too fantasy than what you're going for. So when you are using it, make sure that you are using it to your advantage and not on every single subject that you have in your particular novel. And the second thing I would warn you about is making sure that the action that you put on your subject makes sense. So it is obviously going to be somewhat abstract by putting a human action to a non-human subject. But when you do this, you do have to make sure that it is making sense to what the object is trying to do. If you are just doing it to add a personification element, then it's not necessarily going to work with the subject that you're dealing with. For example, let's say you're going into a forest and you say the trees ran around the circle. Well, this kind of really doesn't make sense as trees don't necessarily move in that sort of respect. By saying that a tree is whispering or talking, that kind of makes sense as trees do make noise, they do rustle as the wind blows through them, etc. So that does tie to the human action. But to say that they would be running or doing something like that doesn't really make sense as the trees themselves would not be moved. They are rooted in a particular spot. So an example of saying that they're talking or whispering or making some sort of noise would be a lot better use of personification than saying that they were physically moving. So obviously that's going to come down to an author's personal choice, but if it doesn't make sense to your reader, then it's really going to throw them out of the scene. So if you are using personification, make sure that it kind of makes sense and the image that you're creating totally paints the picture that you're trying to go for. All right, so that's all I have to say about personification and how you can use it to punch up your prose. If you are enjoying this Back to School Author Academy discussion of literary devices, make sure you're hitting the like button below this video to let YouTube know it's something worth watching. And if you don't wanna miss any of my content, make sure you're hitting that subscription bar and the notification bell below this video as well. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time.